right, so we are the top of the hour. Um, thank you everyone for joining us for Husbiro Community Meeting, July edition. So nice summer heat has been getting us here in Indiana, um, but hope that your weather has remained uh, quite well over the last couple of months. Um, I don't have too much on the agenda today, but we do have um, some things that we want to share with you as far as new development from the Hub Zero team. Um, check, so check. we do have um, Mike Zetner on the call, so I'll let him unmute himself and then he can kick us off from there. And we'll probably have a few more bleeps as people are coming in. So apologize for the little noise. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I think many of you know this already, but maybe some of you don't. Um, <clears throat> I've taken a new job at the San Diego Supercomputer Center to lead the Science Gateways Community Institute. And as part of that activity, we were invited uh, by them to bring Hub Zero out to San Diego as well. So we're currently in the process of migrating um, some employees and some code and a variety of <clears throat> things out to San Diego, uh, including NanoHub and a bunch of other uh, hubs and some new hubs that are just getting going. And um, <clears throat> it's a, a nice sort of thing to um, take Hub Zero to the sort of a next level of um, places where people understand what gateways are and it's part of their central mission. Obviously the Gateway Institute was formed here so it's a big piece of what goes on at SDSC and we're uh, looking at a lot of the available infrastructure to run hubs that already exists out here. So we had a couple of folks out from the Indiana last week visiting uh, to meet with the infrastructure teams here with uh, around the VMware uh, pieces they have here and backup and storage file systems, um, <clears throat> some of the compute uh, capabilities and so forth. So uh, we're having a, a good time learning what's available and uh, ultimately we're finding that in a larger community of people that are working with gateways, um, this ultimately will provide a little bit more robustness to our team in terms of sort of uh, having multiple people capable of filling the role of some of the key personnel so that uh, from an operation standpoint we're uh, less dependent on uh, a few individuals and more reliant on a larger group of folks that uh, understand and know how to keep hubs running. So. Uh, very excited about the the opportunity that's been provided here for us. Excited to be a central uh, component of the Science Gateway Community Institute. Um, excited to be out of the hot weather in Indiana this week, uh, but we'll be back next week and uh, open the floor for anybody who has questions, if anybody has questions. Yeah, and you're welcome to pop those in the chat if they come to mind. Um, and of course, if there's any thoughts that you might have um, after the call, sorry to hear about that, Veronica. Um, I think I've muted you on my end, but oh, here we go, Lee. So we'll have Zero stay open source after the move to San Diego. Yep. Uh, same plan as we've had for quite some time. Hub Zero is remain open source. We're also uh, going to be continuing the One Science Place effort and the conversion of the software uh, to a new stack over the next few years. And that also will have an open source release. Um, so I uh, don't anticipate any changes there. Um, other than uh, other than you know the the continued update of the code base to a sort of a, a new thing over the couple of years, I think we talked about that during the last meeting, or maybe the one before that. All right, perfect. Thank you. No problem. So I don't see any other questions popping through the channel, and again, as Mike mentioned, um, this has been something that's 
been planned um, for a while now, so um, bear with us as we make some transitions, so hopefully you won't notice any. So. Yeah, I suppose along those lines, um, <clears throat> Nancy, I don't know, many of you know Nancy Wilkins, dear. Um, the reason this came about is she had decided she wanted to retire and um, was looking for somebody to take the place in the Gateway Institute that she started. And so this has actually been something we've been discussing with uh, the folks here and the NSF folks for uh, quite a good bit of time now. Uh, so it's it's not uh, something, not a decision we take took lightly, uh, but something that uh, made a lot of sense. Any additional questions from the community? Zuma oh, is left behind, correct? And <clears throat> last I heard from Sean Rice, Joomla is left behind. There's a few uh, trailing things and some um, older versions of the code base, but to my understanding, uh, I think that the new release will have uh, no dependencies on Joomla. Uh, correct. Some of the old Joomla libraries are currently in the core, but they're not actually being used by anything. They're just left there purely as backward compatibility for um, anyone who might have some old code. Um, in most cases, that'll probably be like supergroups um, that have old templates that need updating or something like that. But the uh, the code has already been deleted from the uh, the master branch H. AKA 2.3, um, so 2.3, there will be no demo code at all. When will the new release come out? Now that's a good question. Um, don't I don't think we have a date for that yet, do we? Not at the moment. The only thing that's um, kind of holding that up is actually dependencies um, uh, kind of outside of the CMS in a way. Uh, with the update and 2.3, um, it will require PHP 7, and I think um, Debian 9 or 8 or one of those um, doesn't support PHP 7 yet, which is what the whole hold up, hold up is right now. Um, so once we just kind of get all those dependencies straight, you know, that's when we kind of release it. And that also has <coughs> um, impact with the systems that they run out here at SDSC and uh, which versions of the uh, operating system they prefer to run on. So uh, still some of that architecture mapping that's going on and Pascal's been heavily involved in that and continues to be, although um, I hope today he is actually taking a day of vacation, which he said he was going to, but um, Tends to tends to work on his vacation days a little too much. Yeah, so hopefully he's getting some well-deserved rest before we dive back into that work. But lots of system dev work to be done um, to get the PHP 7 and newer OS working. So perfect. Any other trailing thoughts? Well, you are going to issue an you are going to issue an invitation, aren't you, Claire? An invitation. Yeah, I think it's later in your slides. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Jumping ahead of myself. Um, all perfect. So we'll go ahead and progress further. Um, and thank you, Mike, for sharing the news. And I guess. Sean, don't unmute yourself yet because you're next up to bat. Share some updates about our roadmap, um, recent changes, and what we're still working on. Thank you meant for me to not mute myself again. You said don't unmute yourself. I was like, right, <laughs> yeah. <quiet>. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's see, as far as the, uh, the Boink air, Part, um, unfortunately, I can't speak too much to that, um, or actually the implement Docker for the MyGeoHub part. Um, Pascal was the one who kind of led that. Um, excuse I me. can say something about Boink if you want. 
Yeah, if you don't mind, Mike. Sure. Uh, is everybody familiar with Boink? Or um, I guess um, everybody's muted, so they shouldn't. Okay, Lee says no. Uh, so Boink is something you probably haven't heard much of, but maybe more of you have heard of something called SETI at Home. Um, Boink is a volunteer computing framework, and it is the framework on which SETI at Home works. And we've had a collaboration with <clears throat> David Anderson at Berkeley now for three years, and even before that, to get Boink installed as a compute service on hubs. And the first place that it's starting is on NanoHub. And basically what this means is <clears throat> we can create a really large volume of jobs and ship it out to all these people in the, in the world that hook their computers up and volunteer their spare compute cycles on their computers to do stuff for NanoHub or SETI or other sorts of projects. And the, uh, the cool thing we're doing with Boink on NanoHub is we're not using it as the place where um, compute gets uh, triggered when, when you click the simulation button, but we're using it as the back end for robotic simulation. So what, what that means is we look at simulations that other people have run and we develop more simulations nearby those simulations. So essentially we're automatically generating a lot more simulations than just those that the user clicks. And the purpose of this ultimately is to create uh, a lot of simulation results from which we can train machine learning based models of these simulation tools. So the idea being that a simulation tool might take 20 minutes or 50 minutes or whatever to run. Uh, if we generate lots of Boink runs for that and uh, sort of fill in a, a, a space around what people have run, suddenly we have the ability to create very fast models based on machine learning that give back pretty good but approximate results so that people don't have to wait as long as uh, when they're doing sort of what-if type simulations. Um, the, the goal that I had hoped to reach with Boink is to do 10 million simulation jobs in the next year. I'm not sure we'll get there, but uh, we, we are seeing uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs run uh, a week with, with Boink now. And um, ultimately, I think we're going to try to make this a, a much uh, more integral part of many of our hub offerings. It's, it's really kind of a neat infrastructure and really glad to have been involved with it. And we'll definitely have more details to share about Boink um, at PERC-19 if anyone's attending that conference. I know it's sold out, so um, a lot of big impact happening at that conference, so happy to share details later. And also there will be additional um, information out on the newsletter in the future as we do make progress with Boink and NanoHub at home. So really cool project there. And I guess I know, Sean, I, I said you were up next, but I'm going to throw one more person um, before you. <laughs> so we have done some work on um, our Docker service. It was a short announcement about that um, in our last newsletter. And he will we'll actually have Eric jump in and kind of chat a little bit about that since it has been for my GeoHub and he's been able to work with Pascal a little bit further on that uh, service. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, good. So um, a quick comment from a question in chat about the IBM app scan. Um, for us internally in Hub Zero, we do run monthly scans against the CMS for, for IBM app scan. So um, as far as Docker, uh, I've been working with Pascal testing that infrastructure and getting that set up on one of our currently hosted hubs. Um, they've offered to be our guinea pigs or beta testers. And so far, so good. Um, I created a new workspace, and that can load a Docker container. Um, some things to keep in mind, and this actually affects anyone that uses iRods, um, probably. Mounts are different. 
um, or almost non-existent in Docker. Um, we don't use a, a, like a bind mount inside. Um, we use bind mounts inside OpenVZ containers for Docker. Of course, many of you know that is our volumes. So that's something that we've had to deal with, um, some oddities there. Um, so that, that's in progress. Testing is in progress. I'm working on a new Debian 10 image um, that will become the new default for the tool session environments. So all in all, we're testing. Things are going well. And look for more information in the future. Any questions about Docker stuff? Maybe just a brief overview about what is Docker in case we have a few that haven't heard of this service before. So Docker is our application containers. Um, simplest example that I gravitated to was uh, you create a Docker image, which um, is usually created from a Docker file. And basically just it's kind of a script that you tell it, hey, you know, here's my code, copy it from here into the Docker image and how to tell Docker how to execute it. And then from there, you tell Docker, say, hey, run my application. And it's built to my container and, and lets it run. Um, that allows for very easy updates. You can just deploy a new image. Um, you don't have to deal with merging and whatnot. Um, that a lot of you do with code pushes. Um, and it also creates a, a highly, uh, well, a very common environment. So it's not because it's all containerized, as long as you have Docker installed on your machine, whether that's a server or even a workstation, the application will run. It doesn't necessarily have to be a specific flavor of, of Linux, since all the dependencies and the application code are all built into the Docker image. So Dan's asking, will the whole hub move to Docker deployment? Um, open source version be included in it? And Dan, I can help answer that one. Um, we don't have a direct timeline, so this is currently just a test case on a single hub. Um, once we do get some of the bugs worked out and the implementation actually um, be quite flawless, then we will send it out to be through the open source community. Um, Eric, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Um, the, currently, the whole hub moves to a Docker deployment. Um, if I understand what you're asking, you know, can I download a you know, Docker Compose file or Docker image and spin up a hub, at least with just the CMS? Um, that's farther off than just using Docker for tools. Um, so the first thing that you'll see change is no more OpenVZ, no more OpenVZ kernel. We'll just have Docker for tools, and so then everything else will be on the system operating system side. Um, that that'll probably change as the Mike alluded to earlier. That we'll have new infrastructure and it may be Docker. Um, we're still working on that. Um, will it be included in open source? Yes. Um, time frame on that is unknown. Since we're doing a little bit. Of, sorry, Eric. Uh, I was going to say I've been uh, working with some of the other people on the team, and we've been talking about oh, some of this and uh, I guess how best to do it and. Um, kind of moving away from the uh, like HZ CMS install script and some of that stuff and figuring out what needs to get moved around and shifted around and so on. Um, for instance, I had some uh, initial migrations that would do all the database setup and so on instead of some of the work that the HZ CMS script does and so on. So, um, we yes, we have been looking at doing all of this and trying to get everything prepped more for a fully Dockerized hub install and trying to make it super easy to do, even for our own sanity, you know, for setting up new hubs for our own hosted service and so on. Cool. And I think you guys were looking at different um, configuration managers, whether that's Ansible, Chef, I think Salt was another one that possibly uh, to make the configuration of the hub a lot easier. Yes. All right. Well, great. Thank you very much, Eric. Really appreciate some insight there, and I know that was a um, pretty popular article, so glad we're able to share a little bit more information here. All right, Sean, you're up to that. 
All right. Um, well, I guess uh, going down the list, um, there's obviously been more than just what's here, but these are kind of some of the highlights. Um, uh, we're doing a lot of work. Um, this is a, a especially uh, kind of, I want to say, funded or prompted by um, PER uh, to really improve the uh, publication workflow here. Um, right now, it's kind of a multi-step process when you create a publication, and that can be somewhat of a barrier to actually publishing just because no one likes clicking next, 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 and doing all that kind of stuff. Um, so we're trying to see if we can get that down to as few steps as possible. Um, the goal would love to make it so just like one page, you drag and drop everything, type everything you need on one page, and then click submit. But it might be more like maybe two pages. Um, but that's better than maybe the seven or so that we're kind of doing now. And uh, we'd also, like I just kind of indicated, like to make it a little more, I guess, kind of app-like and uh, really completely rethinking the UI here. Now, in prep for all of that, we've been kind of really digging through the code and doing a lot of uh, cleanup and reorganizing things in both projects and publications um, under the hood. Um, I've already made uh, a number of kind of performance upgrades and fixes and so on. Um, so hopefully you should see some interesting things happening in that space in the next few months. Uh, next up, uh, some more work that was actually prompted by a, a EDS project, uh, Data S, um, which is a hub in, I think, Colorado. Um, and uh, one of the things that they were kind of really interested in, which was a great idea, was to actually have like static rendering of Jupyter Notebooks. This isn't the uh, fully interactive notebook, but if you just wanted to see kind of what a notebook is going to look like and what all steps and content it has without necessarily fully running the thing, um, it'd be nice to see kind of a quick static preview of it. Um, so we're working on that and already have some initial code kind of in place. It needs to be formalized and we plan on hopefully integrating it into resources, publications, and even the wiki. So maybe even just site-wide, no matter where you are on the site, if you have a static notebook or a Jupyter notebook uploaded somewhere, you can click it and view the static preview and so on. Now, Jupyter notebooks themselves use Markdown quite a bit, and Markdown um, is becoming just, well, not becoming, it is extremely popular. So along with that, we're also adding um, Markdown rendering in quite a bit of the uh, CMS, and including a Markdown um, parser for the wiki. So um, you will now eventually, here pretty soon, be able to actually um, use Markdown as the wiki syntax in the wiki instead of uh, the old track-based uh, markup that, to be honest, most people don't really like. <laughs> um, the trick there is coming up with some migrations to actually convert the track-based markup to Markdown markup so that you don't have to actually do anything by hand if you want to switch things over. Um, so that one um, should actually be pretty exciting since Markdown, like I said, is becoming really popular. Uh, one of the other things we also have in there that we've been kind of test running on um, Help Hub Zero is we actually have a Markdown um, renderer for support ticket comments. So you could actually use Markdown in support ticket comments. Um, we use that a lot just because it makes it easier to highlight code blocks and so on. And so far, it's been working really well. Um, so we might just roll that out to all the hubs here soon. And then um, number, well, I guess letter C there is actually kind of what I said already with part A. I've been doing a lot of uh, just cleaning things up under the hood, reworking things, um, really an eye on performance, um, and trying to go back and just clean up and fix a lot of these kind of small user interface user experience kind of things that have been bugging us for a little while now. Um, and then not on the list, but always making security fixes. And I'm still going down the path of trying to remove external JavaScript and or inline JavaScript and CSS and move them to external files and so on, which would allow us to have a, a stricter content security policy, which will be better guards against, you know, cross-site scripting attacks and so forth. Um, so Continuing down that path. Perfect. Well, thank you, Sean. <laughs> yeah, and we do have, um, again, a list of the changes that we make monthly. Those get added into um, our newsletter. And also, it's 
available for everyone to see in more detail on GitHub if you would like to parse through some of the code yourself. Um, and we'll continue updating you guys on this roadmap, um, especially at our next community meeting. And once we hit that last page, right, our additional business, um, jumping real fast, our next one is looking towards October 2019. Um, so one of the items that Mike had mentioned is our invitation. So we would like to see as many Hub Zero users and clients out there at Gateways 2019. It is going to be in San Diego, so you guys can actually make it out there uh, September 23rd through the 5th, 25th. Um, it's going to be an opportunity to see Hub Zero's new hometown. Um, early bird registration is open until August 8th. We do have several um, Hub Zero sessions and also hubs that are out there. Um, they'll be attending and presenting. I believe I saw a couple of familiar faces listed on the schedule, um, like Jeanette Sperhack's, um session about G-Hub, a new supergroup that's coming to V-Hub, which is the Volcanology Hub. Um, we also have Drew Lamar and his team with Cubes um, scheduled to be on the program for Gateways 20, 2019. Um, and of course, if you would like to present the work that you're doing on your hub as well, posters are accepted until August 15th, so you have some time, um, about a month, to get that poster up and running if you would like to have, you know, what's happening on your hub. Um, a little session to share with the folks at Gateways. And of course, this is a great audience to connect back with the Hub Zero users that um, are out there actively using the same code base that you are. It's an opportunity to connect back with the team, see us in person versus just hearing our voices um, every quarter. And then on top of it, it's an excellent opportunity to touch base with, the, in, in general, Science Gateways community and everyone else that's using a science gateway to really bring and impact their science and research with their larger communities. So excellent opportunity all the way around. Um, as I said, our next meeting is October and keep out, keep a lookout for those newsletters. If you're not subscribed to our newsletter, you can go to hubzero.org slash newsletter and sign up for the next one. Um, keep you guys up to date on the latest activities regarding roadmap and the team. Um, let's see. Latest in the newsletter is from April. We've been sending out monthly ones, so if you haven't caught any of those, um, you're free to email me. I'll go ahead and throw in chat um, some places where you can contact us if you're running into any issues there. Um, but yeah, we send those out monthly, the first Wednesday of each month. With that, happy to take additional questions. We're almost halfway through our meeting time, which is typically our trend. I think everyone's pretty happy to get that half hour back of their day. So I'm happy to answer a quick couple of questions, but we're all happy and just excited to see sunshine. Then we can and, go uh, ahead and... The one other thing about the Gateways 2019, this year is a little unique in that it's the same week and the same location as the eScience conference. I uh, don't know if anybody has any interest in that, but uh, if you are thinking about making a visit to San Diego, uh, that may be something that you're also interested in. Uh, you can find their, I think their website is probably linked from the Gateways website um, as well. So if you're, if you want to find out more about that conference, uh, please go ahead and have a look. Yeah, definitely. And um, I'll go ahead and throw the URL um, for our Gateways. And from there, you can go to the annual conference and be able to see the information about Gateways. 2019, um, and as Mike mentioned, it does have a link out to eScience. It's an international community around Science Gateways, so a little bit more of a broader scope with the program there, but still an excellent opportunity to talk to folks um, and maybe see some cool new ideas that are coming out of 
um, the international folks. Uh, one of the posters, I believe, that Mike and I saw last year was about um, football, so U.S. soccer, um, and looking at metrics there and collecting them and building it into a science gateway. So that was one of the proposed posters. So pretty cool to engage with that fellow. All right. Well, it seems like we're happy, enjoying our summers, excited with the new news coming out of Pub Zero. So we'll go ahead and wrap up this session. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending and spending a half hour with us this afternoon and your mornings if you're on the Pacific Coast. And hope you enjoy the rest of your day.